believe in. As they well know, they have to do formal presentations every semester. For the upperclassmen, that's uh, multiple presentations. And I see many bigsets in the, in the crowd that have come to me in private and voice their disdain for presenting and speaking in front of groups and actual fears they have of getting up in front of class. And I tell, often tell some of them my first presentation as a young guy in the agency business working for, I've uh, just been hired by Hall of Famer Bill Westbrook. And uh, I was really interested in his opinion of how I'd done. So I asked him after, the, after it was over and we were in the car leaving, I said, well, hey boss, hey Bill, uh, what'd you think? And he said, well, the whole time you were up there, I was thinking, <laughs> Somebody please throw this guy a lifeline, because he's drowning up there. <laughs> so, uh, of course, I learned a few more things in, over the years in the agency business about presentation skills. But I learned a lot more today at lunch, uh, listening to our speaker tonight, where he energized an entire crowd for over an hour. Uh, he's a former vice president of the historic advertising agency, Jay Walter Thompson. And I'm not going to go through his resume, it would be another half an hour. Uh, but he's a real expert in communication skills, and his companies and programs have trained over a half a million executives. And I know he's going to have a real impact on each and every student here tonight. So please join me in giving a warm welcome to Kevin Day. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure to be here. just trying out the tools as I go. A pleasure to be here with all of you. Now our goal, you saw what it said up there, how to address any audience as though your career depends on it. And why the title? And the reason is because it does. Because it does. How we handle ourselves in front of a group, whether it's at a table, whether it's an audience, and how we're perceived by those listeners that has more impact on your future than virtually anything else you might do. So we're going to be working on those skills. And hopefully, ideally, you will adapt some of those skills to yourself and make them your own. Now, <clears throat> I'm not here to change any of them. My goal is to give you access to inherent powers, abilities that you have within you right now but don't have access to. That's what we're trying to do. So that by the time this is over, you'll be able to try things out so that you can be more effective. Not so that you can be somebody else, so that you can be more effective yourself. That's what the world is all about. And if you happen to go into advertising, as Jim just said, I'll tell you, presentations are everything. Presentations are everything. So let's begin. Here's the agenda. How to communicate confidence, how to make your resume more persuasive, how to sell an idea. Up here in your chart, what are you most afraid of? Jim mentioned this in the introduction. What are you most afraid of? And look at the big fellow on top there. <clears throat> Speaking before a group, 41%. And down below, almost to the bottom, you see what? Death. <laughs> 19%. So taken literally, all it seems to say is a lot of people would rather take a shot at that 19% item than they would at speaking in public. How many people here have ever felt tremors when they had to stand in front of a group? I'm giving you a moment to raise your hand. Just tremors. Get your hands up by me so I can see them. Uh-huh. And, and how many have felt what you would say was real fear, sort of? How many? Okay, a few of us. A few of us. Now, we don't make those rules. They happen. So what we'll be working on is how do we take those butterflies and get them going in the right direction, maybe all together? How do we take the natural mechanism of the human body, yours and mine, and make it work more effectively for us under pressure than it does when there is no pressure? That's what we're trying to do. Because if pressure hurts us, it hurts everybody we touch as we speak to them. And we want to take steps to make that less likely and perhaps not likely at all. So the big, the big enemy here is fear. Now, does it impact everybody? Uh, this is a picture of my father. 
He's not with us anymore. But he was the first Pulitzer Prize winner, sports writer, ever. First Pulitzer Prize winner ever. And because of this big thing working for the New York Times, he wrote the only column that had a title, Sports of the Times, seven days a week. I was just telling this to Dennis Brady today. He wrote seven days a week for 18 years. <laughs> they, they would throw whoever was the boss into jail for that right now. But first one to win a Pulitzer Prize winner, big event, a brouhaha at the Waldorf Astoria in New York to honor the great man, Arthur Daly for winning the Pulitzer Prize. He said, son, would you like to come? And son said, sure. So I, I went. And they had drinks beforehand. I was good at that. <laughs> and I rubbed shoulders with all these great heroes. There were about 500 people in the audience. But you know, all drinking here and talking. At a certain point, a fellow came up to me. He got a clipboard, as they all did in that day. And he said, Kevin, I got a couple of things here. First of all, you're sitting on the dais. I turned my head and looked at the dais. That scared me a bit. And he said, and let's see, you're speaking fourth. I said, speaking fourth? He said, that's right. I said, I don't speak. I, I don't speak. All, all my life I've avoided it. I, I just got out of the Navy. I was a, a Navy jet pilot. And once a month, I had, to have, I had to give the weather to the other pilots. There were 25 pilots in the squadron. I always gave it to somebody else. I don't speak. I can't speak. I won't speak. And he said, you misunderstand. I'm here to tell you not what you will do. I'm here to tell you that you're listed number four as speakers. And that means that three people will get up to speak. And then your name will be called. And what you do is up to you. <laughs> I never liked that man. <laughs> well, now, the tail between my legs, I went up to the day. I sat down, had a piece of paper. And I decided, I've got to write out this talk. This is the worst thing I've ever been through in my life. And so I began to write it out. And I'll tell you, it was such an indelible thing on my mind and in my life that I still remember the first line. The first line was, it's not for a junior member of the Klan. I hadn't used that word Klan before, but I thought it was snappy. To extol the merits, there's another word I hadn't used, extol. It's not for a junior member of the Klan to extol the merits of its headmaster. That was my father, whom I had never called a headmaster before in my life. Now, up to that point, I thought I was doing pretty well. And then this went blank. This thing shut up. No noise came out. And I'm up there at the microphone, when it came my turn, up there in the microphone in front of 500 people, not making a murmur, on a day when my father is being honored beyond anyone in his profession, and his jackassy little son <laughs> can't even say a couple of nice words? Now, such is life, folks. That just shows you what can happen. <coughs> the next day, and this is an aside, next day, I, I mean, I was mortified. I was, next day, I went down to breakfast. My father was down there. And I said, Dad, <laughs> Dad, I am so sorry. I, I let you down. I, 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 I'm so sorry. It was awful. Now, here's one to remember for your own life. He said to me, it wasn't so awful, son. And I needed a lifeline. I said, well, then what was good about it? And he said, well, it was short. <laughs> so you can always compliment someone, no matter how awful they are. That taught me that lesson. So what do I do then? I had to go someplace and find out how the heck to stand up in front of a group. And I did. I went and I took the Dale Carnegie course and then went on from there. Then I got to work for J. Walter Thompson. And I was in the new business area. I was part of that team. And presentations are how you get new business. A client will go, let's say it's Colgate, a client will hire, not hire, but uh, will set out to look at five agencies. That was the process in my day. And every agency makes a presentation. The client will have six, seven, eight people in the big conference room. And the agency will try to look like God. Well, the J. Walter Thompson people, they weren't so good, said I, now that I've had some experience. 
And I worked with them for a while, and then I said, you know what, I'm gonna start a company. That's the way life is, you know. And I'm gonna start a company to help people who must present, and upon whom so much depends, to present more effectively. And so I started my company, Communispond. Built around what, folks? Built around, now this sounds awful because we're all in the intellectual arena of a university, but how do you come across better? If they don't buy you, they don't buy your message. So how do you come across better in front of an audience? There are principles. We think it's all up here, some of it is. God bless this. But you want to know what really works for you? To your advantage or your disadvantage? Boom! That. Boom! This, the package. This thing that drags us through the world. Because this is what they see. This is what they hear. And the world is sensory. Thomas Aquinas, how many have ever heard of him? He said, nothing enters the human mind except through the senses. So what do we have to do? We have to be conscious of that, and we have to learn the physical skills of getting a message across. Energy released, energy received. That's communication. Let's not think it's intellectualizations wafting through space and descending into people's minds. Folks, energy, 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 yours, high or low, your energy impacts that world that you're in front of when you give a presentation. So it takes work, and it takes practice, and it takes skills, which you can learn. Whose skills? Mine? No. Guess whose? Yours. Yours. The whole goal is giving you access to the power that resides in you. Giving you access to the power that resides in you so that you can change people's thinking, persuade people to a point of view, make the world a better place because of the impact you can have on other people. Whoops. So here we see benchmark. We have two volunteers who are going to come up and they're going to demonstrate for us as we go through the skills. Benchmark, your name, a brief description of your job, how you want to be perceived by an audience, and that means you want to be perceived as credible, confident, enthusiastic. You, you pick it. How do you want them to see you? Good we have that, excuse me, in our minds, because that makes a difference. If we know what we want them to feel or think, then we have to work to make it happen. It doesn't happen automatically. Only a mother loves us without cause. For the rest of the world, we must provide cause. Most interesting current activity that you're involved in and why. Why is important. We want this to go 60 seconds for the two volunteers. And those volunteers will come up and deliver a talk, and you will look at them. Oh, God, it's still on here. And here's what you look for. What do you see? What do you hear? What you see is eye movement. What is happening to it? Is the eye moving quickly? Is the eye focusing on an individual? Is it scanning? Or is it focusing? Stance. How does the person stand? Weight on both feet? Weight on one foot? Bouncing around? How does he stand? Hands. Where are they? Are they in the pockets, in front, in the back, folded? Where are they? We're not critiquing. We're just observing. Because the more we observe, the more sensitive we will be to what the possibilities are. What do you hear? Volume 1 to 10. How would you rate it? Five is sort of ho-hum, seven would be pretty darn good, that kind of thing. Inflection, hills and valleys, or flat. Pace, fast or slow, non-words, what's a non-word? Um. What's another non-word that has letters in it? Pardon? Light. Oh, that's a nice non-word, light. light. And if you want to double up, what can you do with that? Like you know. Huh? Real champions say, like you know. Like you know. And usually it goes, um, like you know. <laughs> All right, so here's what we'll do. We will ask our volunteers to come up. First one to come up will be James. And let him hear it as he comes up. <laughs> James, just, just to make it more telling, 
James will go up on the stage. And he doesn't need a microphone. No. Okay. no. Thanks. That's a, that's a good thought, and I know why you're bringing it. I appreciate it. But he doesn't need it, as you'll see. Or perhaps you won't. <laughs> but it's up here. I'll turn that light off. Boom. That's better, right? Yeah. All right, now, James, you, you know what the talk is? And 60 seconds, and see if you can keep going for 60 seconds. That's your audience. Oh, okay. Hi, everybody. I'm James Visbeck. I'm a junior at here at Radford. Um, <laughs> the most interesting thing that I do here is the swim club, I and mean, I do too many things. I'm taking 21 credits, swim club, the lunch club, pep band, um, I don't even know how many things I do. But my favorite one is the swim club because I actually coach a swim team in the summer at home. And this past summer, or this past weekend, we went to Georgia Tech with the swim club. Um, so that was really awesome, national championship meet. Uh, I realized that I am nowhere close to most of the people. But I improved my times and I loved being there. It was a lot of fun. It was just an outstanding time, it always is. I love swimming. You should all join Swim Club next year. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll stop it right there. All right, let him hear, folks. Just so James can hear, only observation, we're not trying to say good, bad, we're just trying to say what we saw in this case, eye movement. What did the eye do? Did it stop and focus on individuals, or did it slide across? Anyone notice? It slid across. Slid across? Okay. Uh, stands, how did he stand? A, a little bouncing around. This isn't bad, we just observed it. <laughs> bouncing around? <laughs> Bouncing around a little bit, where were his hands? Yeah, okay. Now, one of the reasons for watching this is, don't forget, the body is part of the whole process of communicating. Don't expect it to do completely still, still like this. It doesn't do that. Body, one to 10? Seven, eight, five. Seven, eight, five. Okay, somewhere in there. Inflection, hills and valleys, or did it tend to be more flat? So hills and valleys. <coughs> pace, fast or slow? Good pace. Nine words? Did you say one? Just one. That's pretty fantastic. Okay. All right. Now, so we, that's all we did was observe. He's going to have an opportunity to come up next and do the next talk. As you can, see. can you sit down here just for now? Yeah. And we have, we have uh, Michelle. Yeah. <laughs> Whoops, hold it, sorry. Okay. Yes. Hello everybody. My name is Michelle Sulla. I am actually a graduate teaching assistant here at Bradford and I for public speaking. Some of you are my students, so hello, everybody. Thank you for coming, and you will earn your extra credit as long as you turn it in. <laughs> One of the most interesting things that I do that I personally think I do is I play World of Warcraft. Has anybody in here play WoW? Really? Okay, one. One, one person in here besides me plays WoW. Oh, wait, two. Does anybody play League of Three? Three, thank you, four. <laughs> Higher, certainly higher than lower, yes? 
Inflection, hills and valleys? No. Yeah. Hills and valleys. Pace? Fast. Move fast, not words? Zero. Did, you, did she have any you know? No. No, okay. All right, so nicely done. Now, you stay here because you're right here. You I'll tell you what, why don't you sit there? And we will go through the next one of these. Now, here you see scanning. This is blurry on purpose. And this is what happens when we scan an audience. The, we don't focus. The eyes are made, designed to focus. If we don't, if we do this, we get a blur. And the brain can't handle that well. The brain cannot process a blur. So in reality, what happens if we scan is since there's no input, no intake, this tends to happen. The face goes a little bit blank, and the, because there's no intake. We can't help that. That's just what tends to happen. So we're going to be working on focusing, cooperating with the laws of nature in order to make us more personable in front of an audience. If we do that, whoops. break the habit of scanning, focus on one at a time, it reduces nervousness, helps us think on our feet, and helps us read our audience. Three pluses. It puts us in control. So here's the exercise. Tell us about an interesting, fun vacation you had, and just talk about it enough, we say 90 seconds, 60 to 90 seconds, but keep it going for that length of time. And, and that's all. And what are you going to do when you're up there doing that? And what you're going to do, we're going to have some people put their hands up. Would you be a hand up person? So just leave it up for now, just so that we can you see. And you'll be a hand up person? Hand up person? Hand up person? Okay, one, two, three, four, five. And, and hold it up real high so that, and the speakers will be up here on the stage. And what the speaker will do is talk to you eyeball to eyeball, or just like this, for five seconds. And you'll be counting silently to yourself. That's the easiest thing I'm going to ask you to do. And then you put the hand shoop, boom, boom, down, and the speaker will boom, 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 go to the next hand and do the same thing. Mechanical. We're just working on a skill. But that's the goal of this particular skill. So James, All right, hands up, please, our five people. So we have, let's see, one, two, three, Four. So guess who can't count? Kevin. <laughs> right. Uh, all right, so we will add one hand all the way over on the side. That's the young lady there. So there are the five hands. So one at a time. And what you do is focus on one, begin your talk, and talk right into that pair of eyes until that hand goes down. And then you'll go over to your hand. Yeah. Yeah. No moving your lips while you're counting. Very disconcerting up there. All right. James? All right, so the best trip that I personally have ever taken was a church trip um, in 2008. I went to Sydney, Australia. Um, so, I mean, that's awesome because it's just Australia. It's rough getting there, a 14-hour flight, but it's great to be in Australia. Um, we were, we actually had 60,000 people sleeping in this one giant horse racing stadium. It was great, it was amazing. We all loved it, the Pope was there. Um, it was just a fantastic experience in general. And then once the church was done, we did the Australia stuff. So we got to see the Sydney Opera House, um, the Sydney Harbor Bridge. And you um, finished with the five? Yes. Sir. All right. So now what he's going to do is, is uh, finish a thought with each person. That, no hands up, but he'll finish a thought. That means a comma. Some place where there's a natural stop. And then he'll move on to another person. No hints from here. He has to do it all himself. But he'll finish a thought rather than shoop like this, finish a thought, boom, and then move to another pair of eyes. So same talk all over again and do that exercise. Same, yeah, don't worry about the content. Same talk. But make sure you pick out a pair of eyes, stay with it till you finish a thought, come to a natural break. Same thing is all right. Okay, the best trip that I ever took was to Sydney, Australia. 
Um, it was a church trip. There were more than 60,000 people there just for this one event. Uh, it's called World Youth Day. It was in July 2008. Pause. Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we had more than 60,000 people sleeping in this horse racing stadium. And it was just great to have all these people there. Pause. Uh, Pause. Go ahead. Uh, my friend and I actually woke up early in the morning and uh, it's Southern Hemisphere, so it was winter down there, so we're all freezing in this horse stadium. Pause. Um, so early in the morning, him and I went to buy hot chocolate at this stand, and we we're walking back, and they just cut us off and stopped us and wouldn't let us walk anymore. All right, let him hear. <laughs> it's only an exercise, folks. It's a physical pattern that we're trying to run through so that our body gets used to what it's supposed to do. This does not control the world. We wish it did, and we try, but the body, if, if it has knowledge, it can perform. If it doesn't have knowledge, it can't perform. Crazy. Yes, Michelle. Five hands, same five hands up, please. One hand at a time, and just do it sequentially, just so we can follow. Okay. Okay, yeah. Yeah, vacation. Okay. I recently went on a vacation to New York City. It was my first trip ever to New York City. Did the eye flick up? So, yes, it did. It did? All right, just so that you're aware, that's the case. Okay. It, yeah, go back again. Hand, hand stays up until you get five uninterrupted seconds. Okay. I took my very first trip to New York City recently over spring break. It was my first time ever. I have never been to New York City, so it was really, really cool and really, really interesting. I went with my boyfriend, and I also went with his friend. And we met one of his friends from the internet that, well, he met on the internet, and they used to kill dragons together. So it was really <laughs> interesting that they got to go to New York City, and all of us hung out, and he also brought one of his friends, who uh, we went on a triple date, and he brought another one of his friends. And then we went to Red Hook, and we went to this really, really awesome restaurant and had really amazing dumplings that were featured on the Food Network. Okay, all right, very nice. <laughs> Now finish the thought, choo, 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 boom, and then move on. I'll finish up where I left off. So I saw this restaurant called. Now notice when notice when we lose our way. What is our habit pattern? All of us. Look up. What do we do? We hide because we are not sure where we're going. See, we've made a mistake, and we don't want anybody to know that. So we hide. And one of the ways we hide is that. Another way we hide is that. Don't ask me why. That's just the way we do. So when you see it, that's part of the pattern of life that we have been through. What are we working to do? Eliminate that pattern. If we lose our way, we stay right there until we get it back. And the audience does not know that we have stumbled. It's just a discipline. That's all. All right, continue. You're doing beautifully too, Michelle. Go ahead. Back to my story, I actually remember it's called The Good Fork. They were featured on the Have you heard of Bobby Play Showdown? Have you seen Bobby Play Showdown? It was at an Asian restaurant, and they feature other foods, but they have, um, have you heard of bibimbap? It's a Korean dish, and it's got uh, beef, and it has string beans, and a whole bunch of other stuff all tossed together with egg. Pause. Move. It was very, very delicious, so we had that, but their main feature were the pork and chive dumplings, and these were served with an amazing, amazing sauce. So we also had Okay, all right, let's get through. All right, folks, the eye is the only one of the senses directly connected to the brain stem. I just want to share that with you. That's why controlling the eye ends up being the greatest single skill that we can have as a communicator. The only way we can touch a human being from a distance is how? Kachoom! That. Only way we can touch from a distance is with the eye. No other way. And we want to touch from a distance. Because if we touch somebody, we have connected. If we don't touch somebody, we don't know whether we have or not. The whole thing is at large. All right, we're going to go to the next skill.
And here we see in the real world, or in the, in the perfect world, your message, your ideas, your words. Boom! Over there. That's what gets across. Message, ideas, words. In a perfect world. Is that what happens when we speak? No, be nice in a way, I'm not sure that it would, but it would seem nice. But here's the real world. How you look. 55%. How you sound. 38%. And what's that little fellow down at the bottom? What you say, 7%. Now, now folks, this is a study conducted by this Dr. Moravian of UCLA. And when asked the question, you mean this is the least important thing? And is it? No. All he's saying is that if you want to get the 7% across, you've got to obey the laws of nature. The audience is a big eye and a big ear, and forget this now, not quite so big a brain. We got to get in there, though, because once we get into the brain, then we're lodged. Then we're where we want to be. But we must get in there through the eye and the ear, because sensory is everything in communication. Ideas are transmitted physically, folks, not intellectually. Physically, then processed, and then they're intellectual. But they have to get there physically. And we color them. You see, if a person says, I'm the most confident guy in front of an audience that you've ever seen. Now, what happens to you as an audience? Do you believe or you do not believe? Can, can you see how you're affected, impacted? Why? Because somehow we have guidelines set up here in terms of how this vehicle, the body, cooperates with the brain to get an idea across. We have guidelines. <coughs> Nobody wrote them. They just happen to be in there. So if we want to be confident, come across as confident, we've got to look the part. And we have to make sure the content is consistent with what we're looking. So I'm not downplaying that. I want the 7% to sing. But to sing, it has to be carried visually and vocally. Some of the enemies, stance. Hands in the pockets. How many people like to put their hands in the pockets when they speak? And, and, and why, just for fun? You feel comfortable. See, that's what we said. I feel comfortable that way. And I'm going to suggest, folks, it's not about you. It's about them. How does it come across as far as they're concerned? How is the message, how is the message impacted by this? It's not the end of the world, it just doesn't help. And if the hands are in the pockets, I guarantee you, as soon as you're not sure of exactly what you want to say next, you get a lot of motion right here, which probably you don't want when you're starting off. <laughs> All right, so second one. Fist, that's nothing but energy leaking out, which it will do unless it's used. Over here, leaning, no good. One to one doesn't hurt. What does it look like here? Weak, right? Sort of. Doesn't help. Pardon? Looks like your foot's asleep. Yeah, your foot's asleep. Uh, this thing doesn't help us. So moving around all the time, moving target, doesn't help us. In the middle, elbow glue. Here's what that means. This. This is how every good speaker speaks. Good speaker. I'm exaggerating a touch. Like this. And then they'll go like this. Or like this. And then they'll gesture and this thing will wait for its partner to come back. Boom, 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 boom. Oh, there we are, we're back together again. And that's what happens with every good speaker. Now here's what you're going to be working to do from now on, and what our demonstrators are going to work to do. This is neutral. Boom, not this. Here's neutral. What does neutral mean? That's just where gravity works. And then you, one hand at a time, you gesture like this. Boom, this hand goes down, this one comes up. But notice the difference in terms of visual impact. This is what's working for you. 
This is what's working for you, not this and this. So we're going to work to do that. Let's see how it plays. OK. Next. Uh, we'll let this go for now. This is sound. It just means 7 to 8 is dynamic. If you get way down here at the bottom, 1 to 2 is inaudible. We've got to get the volume up. I can be heard, people say. It's not whether you can be heard. It's what kind of impact does the vocal quality have. That's what speaking is all about, about is impacting the mind of the listener, which you don't have access to except for a distance and except through the senses. Energy exercise. Tell a story about an awkward or embarrassing incident in your life, such as a, a ski experience, maybe getting on the chairlift, uh, falling over a, a, a kid's tricycle, whatever it may be. Uh, an awkward or embarrassing incident in your life, it should involve action, boom, which you can act out in front of the audience. Just let us see it. That's your job, the speaker's job. Let us see what's happening as well as hear what's happening. And that means it's their turn. Let's talk to you. And James, why don't we go with you? James said, thank you very much. You may not have heard that. <laughs> OK, so begin. 60 seconds, 90 seconds. Yes. OK. Uh, the most embarrassing moment of my now, life. Now, hold on a second. Most embarrassing moment. Wait on both feet. There you go. And here are the hands. Go ahead. Most. The most embarrassing moment of my Wait life. Wait on both feet. Wait on both feet. Yeah. So and I just I'll just sit here right here and you you continue. Most embarrassing. <laughs> Go ahead. The most embarrassing moment of my life was when I was six years old. It was summertime and the swim season was coming around. Um, so my two older brothers were on the swim team. I tried to be on the swim team. I right, hold it up. You're, you're, you tried to be on the swim team. How am I doing here, folks? <laughs> How's he doing up there? <laughs> oh, okay. Feet stable. Yeah. Go ahead. My older brother, is that what it was? Younger brother. Yes. To my two older brothers, two older brothers. both on the swim team. Yeah. Wait on both feet. <laughs> so I wanted to be on the swim team also. Yeah. I tried out, and I was flapping and flopping and kicking around in the pool and basically drowning. Um, so I wasn't on the swim team, and <laughs> that wasn't too embarrassing. But the embarrassing part is sitting at their swim meets all summer long, waiting for them to finish swimming while I can't go in the pool. Okay. Well, now, I, he's still beautifully, isn't he? Yeah. Now, once again, and go back to my two young, older brothers. My two, from that point on, wait on both feet as you are. Now, double the volume. My two older brothers, shout. My two older brothers were both on the same Is he shouting? Yeah. Even more. My two older brothers. My two older wait brothers. Wait on both feet. Wait on both feet. <laughs> <laughs> my two older brothers, shout. My two older brothers were both on the swim team. And I tried to be on the swim team, but I was flopping and flapping around. And, and I love it. Time for a second. Is he too loud? No. Does he feel he's too loud? No. Yes. Do you and I feel we're too loud when we're up there? Yes. But we need that. The audience needs that. Why do we do it? Because they need that. What about me? I don't feel like doing it. Not a part of the thought process. They need it. We do it. If there's an audience out there, we give them what they need in order to get the message that we have in mind. That's our job. That means energy. Energy released, energy received. Volume up, one of the biggest things. Go back again. Two older brothers. And you do it very well. Nice change. Go ahead. So my two older brothers were both on the swim team. Anyway, right up like this. My two older brothers. Go ahead. My two older brothers were both on the Drop swim team. Drop the other hand. Go ahead. Drop the yeah. <laughs> and I wanted to swim with them because they both were. So, of course, I'm out there flopping and flapping around in the pool and basically drowning, so I couldn't be on the team. Um, so I had to spend the whole summer just sitting on the sideline. Well, just that part. So I had to spend the whole summer loud, loud, loud. Go ahead. So I spent the entire summer <laughs> watching the two of them swim while I sat there watching and waiting to get in the pool when the meet ended. All right, let him hear. Let him hear. <laughs> I mean, just think, they had such a good time. Did you? <laughs> All right, nice, James. All right, Michelle? All right, let her hear it. She goes up. Yeah. 
I come from California. Okay, try for a second. This is neutral now, one hand at a time. Very nice, Michelle. <laughs> I come from California, and my family goes camping in Mammoth Lakes every single year. Right away. One year, I went up to this beautiful, beautiful waterfall <coughs> called Minaret Falls. And Minaret Falls is a cascade, so it goes up top, it evens out, and it comes back down. I decided to travel up to the middle spot, and it was really, really pretty. And here I was in a bathing suit with no shoes on, and I come up here, and I'm like, oh, this is so cool. So I wanted to go get my camera. One hand at a time now. So I wanted to go get my camera. <laughs> <laughs> so I decided to walk down the side of the cascade. Unfortunately for me, since I was barefoot. Now, teammates, do you like that better like that? I mean, just answer the question yourself. It's crazy. She's terrific. No question. But the, even the terrific is better this way than they are both together. Continue. So I was walking down the side of the cascade, and Ooh. unfortunately, I had no shoes on. <laughs> and without having shoes on, I could not really make my way down. It was pretty steep, and I kept looking and looking, and I was like, oh, how am I going to get down? And I saw this little tiny ledge. So I shimmied my way down to this ledge, kind of like crab walking. <laughs> so I was doing that, and unfortunately, this ledge had a little piece of algae and a little piece of moss because there was a little stream coming down. So my foot hits this stream, hits this ledge, and I slip, I land on my butt, and then I slide all the way down the cascade into the bottom of the pool, and I smack myself. Okay, let her hear, let her hear. Now, just ask yourself, did you enjoy that, what she did? And then why did we enjoy it? Because we had something to see. Because she gave so much of herself to get it across to us so that we could feel what she felt, experience what she experienced. That's the idea, make it come alive for the listeners out there. And we have to go through some stuff to do it. Beautiful job. Beautiful job. Okay, you are released from bondage. <laughs> nice going, folks. And I'll just ask by a show of hands, confidence. Up top you see visual, vocal, verbal. What demonstrates confidence the most of those three things? Is it by what we see, the visual impact, the vocal impact, or the verbal impact? All right, we'll start off. How many say visual? How many say vocal? How many say verbal? Wait a second, we're in a university here. Oh, we got a verbal. We got a verbal. All right, now why do we not say verbal? Because, folks, well, that has to be interpreted. You see, we don't, we don't viscerally judge verbal. That has to come through a prism, through a screen. And the screen is the total impact of the human being. Here's what Emerson said. He said, what you are, Ralph Waldo, that is, what you are thunders so that I cannot hear what you say. I mean, that's, a, that's such a profound statement. In other words, the impact of the person is so great, it colors everything. What is the impact of the person? It's this. That's what we see, this. And you people are quite blessed, based upon what I've seen on this campus today. So, <coughs> poof, not bad. Let it work for you when you get up in front of a group. Now, a little tip here, a resume. You're always selling yourself, beginning with your resume, and I'm going to make a suggestion here, and you can shoot me down if you've heard otherwise. What do we do? Every resume looks something like that. Maybe there are better ways now. That that's a, talks all about how great you are up there, and it's, it's regimented. Here's what I would suggest, and I'll tell you why. Here's a, maybe, Add what you are most proud of or your hobby. 
Now, why do I say that? And I'm just going to give you an example. If you go through an interview, what the person interviewing you has to do is pick out things in there and ask you things. Same as he did the time before, or she did the time before that. And they'll ask you something about what's in there buried or surface. It doesn't usually tell all that much about you. But if you have something like a hobby that's particularly interesting, that's all you. If you have something that you're most proud of, that's all you. An example, I interviewed for a job at J. Walter Thompson. I had just come out of the Navy. I was a, a Navy pilot. And I put down on my resume, which was nothing but school, right, and Navy, nothing but school and Navy, and I put down flying off aircraft carriers was my what I was most proud of. Well, a guy named Clark Carter interviewed me, and he went through the resume, and he said, flying off aircraft carriers. I said, that's right. He said, what is that like? And so I began to talk about that. And he asked questions. At a certain point, he took me. I hadn't been asked anything else, by the way, what was on the, and went to the next interview. You know how you go to the next interview? And he said, this is an airline. This is a Navy pilot. He has flown off, landed on aircraft carriers. You ought to hear the story. Tell him the story that you just told me, Kevin, about. And I went to four different offices talking about landing aboard aircraft carriers. Now, I didn't see anywhere where I was applying for a job as someone that landed on an aircraft carrier. But that's what they wanted to talk about. And boom, I get hired. You say, well, that's absurd. Of course it is. But we don't make the world. We just live in it. <laughs> and if you've got something interesting, put it down here. I'll tell you another, another one of those. Uh, uh, forgive me for this. But I was applying for another job. And I, did, I didn't put that down. Under hobby. I put tightrope walking. That stops him every time. <laughs> tightrope walking. Oh, is that there, said I? Yeah, it is right here at the bottom under hobby. Oh, yes. <coughs> tightrope walk. He said, how do you do that? And so we had a, a little bit on how you do tightrope walking, what you focus, and all this stuff. Well, he took that one we went into, and he said, here's a guy that can walk any line you want to put in front of him. He's a tightrope walker. And I went from office to office. Now, did he get me the job? And, you know, I, I did get the job offer, but it's not so much it gets you the job. It makes you yourself. You have let the person in on the inside. So a suggestion. Color. Local color, that's what that is. Beautiful. If you, if you have a hobby, or something that you're most proud of that normally wouldn't put it down there. Only takes a line. Only one, don't put two. They compete. Uh, how to sell an idea. Uh, up here you see Mother Teresa. Uh, a few, I'm going to back up here a bit. There's an organization called the YPO. It's called the Young Presidents Organization. I'm going to put her off here for a sec. Young President's organization, you have to be president before you're 40, and then you can stay on for another 10 years, they throw you out at 50. Very elite kind of a thing. And they have what they call universities. 500 presidents, excuse me, and their significant others, that's 1,000 people, go to New Delhi, to Berlin, to every different country that you can imagine. Paris, they went to. Nice, I know that's similar. Rome. Uh, but th that's where they go. And they need people to give talks. Obviously, they have to get somebody at the beginning. Mother Teresa was invited to the one in New Delhi. Now, Mother Teresa got up there looking a lot like she looks in that picture, which is not too terribly impressive, by the way. She got up there, and she told her story, she was challenged. She said, what is she? She's a mother. And she told the story of her life and what she does. Question and answer session. A fellow named Jack Linkletter, son of Art Linkletter, who was a big television producer or commentator, 
uh, Jack Linkletter was sort of the MC, and he said, uh, Mother Teresa, I have a question over here. And one of the young guys, young presidents, 28 years old, said, Mother Teresa, why do you call yourself mother? You have a worldwide organization. You've got to be an administrator. You couldn't make it work. Where does the mother stuff come from? I tell you, I cringed. In, in the seat, that was, so, that was profane to me, but not my job. So Mother Teresa said, thank you for the question. I am not an administrator. I am a mother. And he said, how could you be and keep this thing going? And she said, let me give you an example of what I did night, last Thursday in Calcutta, where our home office is. And she said, another, another sister and I took our little <coughs> wagon and went down into the streets of Calcutta where we saw all of these bodies lying down, all of them different degrees away from death, lying in the street, streets of Calcutta. And we selected one person who was, had been there, obviously, for some time, but he was breathing. We always check that first. We selected that person, and we put him on our sled. And you might say, our, our wagon, how could you lift a man and put him on the wagon? But I've got to tell you that at that stage, they only weigh about 60 pounds. And the other sister and I just lifted him by the arms and the legs and put him on our wagon. And then we wagoned him back to what we call our hospital, which is nothing but a Quonset hut. And we got him into the hospital, and the first thing we did is gave him a bath, which he probably hasn't had in six months. He was not, he was not awake, he was not conscious all this time. Gave him a bath, and then wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and I sat him down in this little uh, lean to against my rocking chair. So with his head on my lap, I just rocked back and forth, and his eyes the entire time were closed. And at a certain point, as I cooed to him, he looked up into my eyes and said the first words that he had said since it all began. He said, I can die now. And he closed his eyes and died with his head in my lap. Now you ask me why I say I'm a mother? It's because that's what I do. I mother the helpless people who are near death and have not been loved by a human being for months or perhaps years. I give them that love <coughs> before they die. And sometimes they die with a smile on their faces. That's why I'm a mother. Well, the resounding applause was incredible. Uh, young Jack uh, Linkletter thought the thing went very well. And the, uh, that day ended. Now, Mother Teresa was asked by five of those young presidents, would they go with her the next day into the streets? Now we're in New Delhi, of New Delhi, where the same thing is, the bodies are lying right there on the cobblestone, lying there, dying. They're going to die. They're, they have no source of food. They have no source of anything. And there they lie. And they picked up one of these people, went through exactly the same kind of a scene with Mother Teresa. Now, we're in a capitalist society, friends. Those five YPO presidents each donated a million dollars to Mother Teresa after having had that experience. which she was doing, she was fundraising. But that's how impressed they were with what took place. So it's by our actions that they shall know us. And that's just an example of one person working her way through the world, her way. All right, folks, I tell you what, uh, we're at 6 o'clock right now. And I think, I think I actually have it on here. Incidentally, isn't that a beautiful face somehow? I don't know why I love it, but I do. Oh, incidentally, I, whoops, I, I shook Mother Teresa's hand. And I didn't wash this hand for four days after I shook Mother Teresa's hand. That was the impact of that moment. You're a jerk, Kevin. Okay. <laughs> Tell
Time for questions. Time for questions. Any questions or comments about the advertising business or anything else that we've gone through and how it plays? And we have a microphone. Microphone coming. Um, how much money did it cost for you to? How much money did it cost for you to uh, start your business? How much money did it cost me? Yes. To start my business? Yes. Uh, my business I started while I was at J. Walter Thompson, and actually called on J. Walter Thompson accounts to get started, and so we began to be profitable almost immediately. Uh, at a certain point, J. Walter Thompson said, "We've got to own you." This is within a couple of months. What would it cost us to buy 75% of your company that had just begun? And I, like a jerk, said $35,000. Three years later, I bought back that 75% for $450,000. Uh, so I, it's a hard question to answer, but I can see it is a service company, so that's why it costs so little. Other questions or comments? Yes. And you're about to? Okay. What do you do if you're giving a speech and you feel like you're going to faint? Uh, well, folks, that, that kind of a question is very tough. I'd love to hear from the audience what you think you should do. Sit down. Yeah, yeah probably sit down. Yeah. Sit down right here. Call up, get someone, say to somebody, could you hold this for a minute? I don't feel feel well, get a glass of water. If you feel you can go on, go on. If not, have to say, another time, folks. <laughs> have you been there? initial interview in the first place, like to actually get face to face. You know, I missed the beginning of that. Do you have any suggestions about actually getting to that interview? Uh, for example, for like job opportunities, um, in many cases you can't even get face to face with people. Any suggestions for how to? How to actually gain that uh, face to face experience, to gain that audience, or maybe applying for work or jobs, opportunities like that. Uh, so you're asking how do you get an audience with the person that you want to be interviewed by? Right. How, how do you get? How do you get? How do you make contact and get an appointment with the person you want to be interviewed? Or just like in many cases where, where you're looking for work or jobs nowadays, it's even hard to get that face to face where you can present yourself. Uh huh. So I guess a way to get your foot in the door. All right. But what is the best way to get your foot in the door? I I, I think it, it hasn't changed much over the years. It's to find somebody who knows that person you want to see, whom you you know, talk to that intermediary. Ask him how you could go about getting a meeting. The person will say, I think I could get you a meeting. And you say, terrific. Thanks for bringing it up. And ask him to get you a meeting. But it, it's almost always an intermediary because we have to have contact. And an intermediary gives us contact. Yes? What's the best advice that you've ever received like, on your very few success? What, what is the best piece of advice that you've ever received <coughs> as a public speaker? Well, what is the best piece of advice you've ever received as a public speaker? And I'll tell you, this sounds a little bit crazy, but it was talk louder. Now, why? Because I wasn't. That's why. And what does an audience feel? Don't forget, an audience is way back there. You, I, here's what I promise you. You will never, ever, ever be too loud speaking to a group of people. Why? Because you've got whatever they used to call these governors. Something inside you says, don't go beyond that. 
Usually it shuts you down too soon. We'll never go too loud. You're just too far along in life to make that kind of a, a mistake. But that's the most, most uh, valuable thing I've been told. Yes? Yes? What got you interested in advertising? I missed that. What got you interested in advertising? What, what got me into, <laughs> into advertising? Well, uh, I, I had an uncle who was in advertising, worked for Lennon and Newell on the Liggett and Myers account. Nix, Nix, as they say. Now, that was a cigarette account. And he got me a contact at J. Walter Thompson, called the fellow up, said, hey, I've got this brilliant young guy. And he sent Kevin over there, which was a disappointment for the fellow doing the interviewing. But it got me an interview. That's how, that's how I got started. But I was very interested. I was interested in the fact that you could run ads and change people's minds. That was staggering to me. I thought people ignored advertising until I got into it. It's a darn good career. And incidentally, Don Draper, how many people watch that? Don Draper is exactly, forgive me for being that old, exactly my era. Even to the point where Clearasil is one of his accounts. And the Vic Chemical Company where I worked is one of his accounts. And so the terminology, everything, Astonishing, astonishing how accurate that is. Any other? Yes? Um, what are the similarities and differences between presenting to a group and presenting to one or two people? All right, what are the similarities, dissimilarities, presenting to a group versus sitting down? Now, folks. Up front, what you've got to do is everything you can to interest, involve, educate, keep people alert, everything you can, and it's energy. Sitting down, gestures are all smaller, but the enthusiasm must be there. You know where enthusiasm comes from, folks? Enthusiasm is en and theos, the, the, uh, the Greek, and it means the God within us. Enthusiasm just breaks down doors and opens up pathways. So sitting down, if you're enthusiastic about something, you can't believe what that can do. And it doesn't mean shouting. It just means showing the degree to which you believe. I don't care how much you know until I know how much you care. <laughs> that great Indian proverb. We've got to care sitting down, standing up, just a different level. Yes? What's your biggest piece of advice for a college student going into an interview um, for an internship? Uh, best piece of advice a college student going? Into an uh, interview for an internship. For an internship. Mm -hmm. okay. What's the best piece of advice to, when a college student is going into, <coughs> trying to or going into? Going into an interview. Well, the, 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 the most important thing for a college student to do is to show interest one, knowledge two. Ignorance is the thing that knocks you out so quickly. So some pre-work in terms of knowing enough to be able to demonstrate awareness at a higher than average level. And then interest from that point on. I just want to tell you one story and then we'll go. Uh, you've heard about the two martini lunch and you're probably not interested. Are you? Would you like to hear about one of those and what happened in the old days? Uh, I'll give you an example. I was, my account was American Home Products, Dristan, Dristan Nasal Mist, Dristan Tablets. Are you familiar with those? Colds, colds and flu. And at one point, the, I was the management supervisor. I was handling the, the whole piece of business. And the guy I was working with, my client, said, hey, we have a fella working over in this office who's introducing a new product. And it's really <coughs> going to be something. It's a microfine. Aspirin dissolves three times as fast as Bayer. And he's looking for an agency. Would you like a meeting? And I said, great. So I went in and spoke to the fellow, and he talked to me, and I said, look, why don't we do this? Here's what I've got from you, and I played back. Always play back what you heard. The person is more interested in hearing what he said than he is in hearing what you said. Incredible. Much more interested in hearing what 
he said, then what you said. So I played back what I heard from him, and I said, here's what I'd like to do. I'd like to take this back to the shop, that's the way we talk, and give it to the creatives. That's the copywriters, the creative people. Uh, and come back to you with a representation of our thinking that I think would cause that product to break through and fight for the top of the analgesic market. Okay, said he. So I went back to the shop and I got Emil Frizard. Emil Frizard was a copywriter, great copywriter, rather ample of size, and had one disturbing habit amidst all his great qualities. He drank. But I got a meal for his art and I said, look, we got this great thing. We sat down together and we worked out what we would put on a storyboard form in terms of the commercial. And I, I thought it was fantastic. And I said, Emil, I'll get a meeting. I got a meeting. I said, Emil, next Thursday, 2 o'clock. And so at 2 o'clock, Emil for his art and I went over to 3rd Avenue, the pink building, which was American Home Products office, home office, only a few, few blocks away from J. Walter Thompson and went up to the 14th floor and sat down in the guy's office. Emil over here, a little bit behind me. Me here against the desk, and I began this whole thing about how we analyze the pros and the cons of the, part of the marketplace. There is an avenue that is just waiting for the advent of a breakthrough. And we have the breakthrough because of the microfine nature of this product. And we've put together a commercial that I think might just be a blockbuster. And I talked a little bit longer, and then I say, however, don't listen to me. Hear it from Emil Frizard. And I turned and looked, and Emil was asleep. <laughs> now, if you want in your life, you know how you can say, I was startled once? All I could think of was, holy goodness sakes, Emil, what are you doing to me? And so I, hey, Emil, Emil, Emil. And Emil come up like this. And however, folks, we just talked about how physical reactions and impressions are. Do you think we got that piece of business? The two martini lunch, which Emil had had three, maybe four, maybe five. Huh? We didn't get the doggone thing, which to this day irks me. And I don't blame Emil. I blame myself for not having turned around sooner when he was still awake. <laughs> All right, folks, I tell you, I think our time is up. Thank you for your attention. Appreciate it.